Good afternoon, Sir Neil. It's a very great pleasure to welcome you here to Bracknell to participate in our video interview series. Now, you joined the Royal Air Force in 1939. Was that just before the war or just after the war? Just, just before. Okay. April 39, I had been in the uh, RAF Volunteer Reserve. Yes. Before that, learning to fly at uh, Schoon near Perth, yeah. being a Scot. Yeah. And uh, this was a great thrill, of course, and a great excitement. And this was right in the middle of the expansion scheme, the pre-war expansion scheme. If you remember, there was a short service commission that was going pot cakes, and they had opened this reserve school at Perth. And at these various centres, they opened the uh, Volunteer Reserve Pilot Navigator uh, and air gunner schemes, and I, I uh, joined in the pilot scheme in uh, February, March, April, 1939. So I had just started my training. Yes. I had gone solo on the Tiger Moth uh, before the war broke out, and uh, as soon as it did, we were all called up and disappeared down to uh, England to continue our training. When did you convert onto the Hurricane? Converted onto Hurricane in uh, in uh, uh, May, 1940. This is uh, just before the Battle of Britain, yes. and uh, there weren't a great many losses, so the throughput was, was fairly yes. slow. Yes. But uh, I converted onto Hurricane at that time. And did you go straight from Con the OCU onto one squadron, or did you have a squadron before one squadron? No, one squadron was the first squadron I want, went to. One squadron was in 12 group, and they were using the groups outside 11 group as yes. a sort of training uh, process for uh, the squadrons in 11 group, who by then were losing. Yes. A great number of pilots, so the flow through one squadron into the squadrons in uh, and in eleven group was quite quite swift. Uh, at the same time, the squadron was operational, and we were occasionally used for for a sortie or other. But I didn't stay in one squadron very long. I completed my sort of operational training there, did a few sorties with one squadron, mm -hmm. got to learn some of the one squadron yeah. law, yeah. and then uh, as the battle was sort of reaching its height, uh, uh, I was uh, posted to 17th yeah. Squadron, which was then at Martlesham Heath, right. having been bombed out of Debden. Yes, yes. Now, you were a sergeant pilot then. Yes. Too. Was there any distinction made at all between NCO air crew and officer air crew at that time? Well, I sat on mine domestically. I would have thought in the crew room very little. Yeah. I remember at Marsham Heath uh, there were ten sergeant pilots in the squad, and we all lived in the same hut in the most disgusting conditions. <laughs> I would never allow it now, but of course it was wartime, and it was uh, people were being crammed into the, into the, into accommodation which one would never have had in peacetime. But uh, the moment one stepped out into the dispersal, which in fact were some not rather nice houses round the Marsham Heath mm -hmm. airfield. Uh, it, the rank really disappeared in the evening when we went out to Ipswich and places took together yes. and, uh, and drank. Yes. Uh, we either operated from Marsham during the day or flew down to, uh, to North Weald or over to Stapleford Abbots uh, just outside North Weald or over to, uh, to Debden and uh, as it had recovered and uh, operated from there. Hmm. One other reflection on that period, as you say, you're a VR pilot. I, that, has that had any influence on your current thinking about the use of auxiliaries? You know the debate, um, which is, I think is particularly intense now, that sometimes we feel in the service we aren't capitalising on the goodwill there is in the country, which was clearly present at the time of threat. Do you think we could capitalise any more on that now, through any kind of reserve or auxiliary services? Well, I think so to a certain extent. I was a great believer in the VR scheme, and I think it, it, uh, it played up uh, extremely well during the war, and one could say that the, the VR uh, aircrew, particularly in Fighter Command at that time, and later on in Bomber Command as well, and Coastal Command, uh, held the line largely, because a lot of them, uh, present company probably uh, included, were very in intelligent and uh, were people of, 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 of some uh, uh, future in, in, in the various walks of life. Those and the short service officer, I think, were the ones which probably uh, held, the, held the ring, mostly in, in, in the Battle of, Battle of Britain. Um, when you try to transfer it uh, to, uh, say, 1980, it was a little more difficult because of the great complexity of aircraft we've got now. And uh, down the years, the Air Force Board, um, having been a part of the Air Force Board for a good number of years, one took, took the decision that it was too difficult and too expensive to try and train uh, reserves, VRs or auxiliaries into flying uh, first-line uh, first aircraft. Now, I think uh, the situation changes to a certain extent. Uh, I think, for instance, there's a great uh, requirement now for a, a reserve, a large reserve organisation to help with all sorts of things, uh, guarding vital points, uh, guarding airfields, flying helicopters, uh, being used in all sorts of roles, perhaps regionally, recruited around a particular station, and uh, being able to move in a period of warning to let those who are highly skilled, uh, free from guard duties, etc., to move into their original employment. I still think it's difficult. 
And though I know the United States uh, Air Force have succeeded in it with the with the civil civil guard, it's still difficult with the money being a little short as it still is now to train people on, the, say, a tornado. Uh, as a weekend air crew or an air crew that's been, been flying over two weeks. Now, helicopters, helicopters and probably transport are different. Yeah. I think it's something which one uh, in the Air Force will want to be watched the whole time. I have a great uh, admiration for the volunteer reserve spirit, as you would imagine. And I think uh, it's something which we must foster, and I'm delighted to see the uh, enthusiasm now, which is greeting some of the new reserve schemes which uh, uh, the Air Force are putting out be it all on a very limited basis. I hope the government will be prepared to expand this quite uh, quite greatly in the next uh, few years because we are running into uh, a period of grave danger, I think. Yes, indeed. That, in fact, leads me very quickly onto the next point. We could spend an awful amount of time simply looking at your activities in World War II, where you've had a very distinguished combat record in the Middle East, I think in North Africa, in Burma, in the Far East, as well as in the European theatre. But there's one particular phase in that which I would like you to reflect upon, if you would, sir. And that's the one, what was it, the 151st wing, the expedition yes. to Murmansk yes. and Archangel in August of 1941. Yes. But it was a very interesting uh, expedition, and one which I haven't, don't think has been written up properly. Maybe it will be uh, one of these fine days. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we left uh, uh, Glasgow in an aircraft carrier, the very old Argus, which was an Italian liner of the 1418 war, with a sort of piece of metal on top. Two, two hurricane squadrons. They had been placed on board. They were to be flown off, but they had been put on by crane. We then did a great sortie way up into the uh, Arctic Circle, uh, way north of, of Murmansk, where the compasses don't really work very well. And uh, uh, we were due to fly off at 3 o'clock in the morning from this carrier to Bayanga Airfield, which is just outside Mur Murmansk port. Come the morning, there was thick fog, and you couldn't see across the deck. And, uh, However, the captain had been uh, up during the previous hours and had noted a clear spot, and he sailed the carrier back into this clear spot and said, right, it's all right to go now, you can, you can fly off. So off we flew it straight through the fog, of course, uh, which was on course. And uh, by dint of uh, uh, some fairly crafty na navigation by the, the squadron commanders, we uh, eventually had a, a good landfall and, uh, and, and uh, landed at Vianga, two squadrons, 81 squadron and 134 squadron, and I was in 134. Mm -hmm. The next uh, uh, five months was spent operating with uh, Soviet fighters and Soviet uh, was escorting Soviet, Soviet bombers. Mm -hmm. And then as the weather was getting bare, darker and darker and snow was starting, we uh, trained the Soviet uh, pilots to fly the Hurricane. Yeah. And uh, these were the, f we then gave them uh, the Hurricanes, and these were the first of 4,890 Hurricanes which the Soviet Air Force got during the war. A number of uh, aircraft which is not uh, generally known, I think, and which Pravda, yeah, yeah, Pravda keeps very, uh, very, very quiet. quiet. Then we, uh, we came back from uh, Vyenga in, uh, in, in a Russian convoy and had a, an interesting journey back to, back to this country and then resumed our normal squadron duties. But it was a very interesting period seeing the Soviet Air Force uh, operating. They still had uh, the aircraft which they'd used in the Spanish Civil War, largely, apart from the I-16, which was not un unlike a Spitfire in a way, but it, it had a very high wing loading and uh, it wasn't so fast. In fact, its speed was m much more like the speed of a hurricane. But the thing that did uh, impress one, one must say, was the great courage of the, all the Soviet air crew who were there at that time. Most of them, some of them I managed to follow through for a year or two, uh, perished in, in the great patriotic war. Mm -hmm. But they were extremely courageous and flying with very poor equipment against uh, 109 Gs mm -hmm. and J U 88s, yes. etc. Yes. So it's something much fun keeping the back of my yes. mind. And one remembers the Soviet Air Force was, uh, as such, of the Russian Air Force, was in business before the Royal Air Force, which some people uh, don't, don't remember. Was Kuznetsov, the, the Major General there, was he? He's not. The, the, the Kuznetsov who recently retired from no. the Soviet. No, 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 he I died many years ago. Yes, I thought he couldn't be. He no. no, he was, uh, he <coughs> was uh, commanding the, the naval air region in right. that part of yes. the world, of which yes. the wing became part of. Yes. But he, with uh, wing commander Ramsbottom, yes. and it's very interesting to see, I think now looking back, that uh, an expedition of that size and of that important political nature should be sent overseas with the wing commander in charge, and a very good he was too. He and Kuznetsov uh, ran the show operationally, but there was no radar. Usually the first uh, knowledge we got of the Germans were attacking was that uh, bombs falling in and around the airfield. So it was a, it was a fairly hair-raising period. Uh, Soviet fuel wasn't so good, and uh, the engine, our engines didn't work very well on it either.
In addition to the, the impression of courage, did you form any other impressions, say, about the technical competence or any kind of political supervision? Because the, the reason I ask that, my knowledge is extremely limited virtually to one or two articles in that book by Griffiths, which you know, was written in 1942. And um, naturally, Russia was still our ally at that time, and it's very difficult to read between any lines. Was there, were there any other impressions which stayed with you? about the Russian character, about Russian attitudes, apart than just from the courage? Well, I think the technical competence was very high. The, they hadn't been fighting for very long, as you will remember, mm -hmm. historically. Uh, they hadn't developed the sort of techniques which we had uh, developed during the Battle of Britain, so we helped, uh, yeah. we helped uh, teach them there. I got the impression that uh, they were very quick learners. Yes. And uh, uh, people who uh, were, for instance, learning the uh, intricacies of the Merlin engine and the Hurricane too, which we had, uh, were very quick to, to, to pick this up and we worked through uh, uh, interpreters, female and male, who had uh, come up from Moscow and uh, the speed which they managed to pick up the, uh, the technical details of the, of the Merlin were first class. So one looks forward now at uh, a lot has happened since then. That's People right. are in space yeah, and uh, right. a, a lot of graduates passing out of many, many Soviet yes. universities and I have no doubt in my mind of their, of their capability. One must not ever right. underestimate right. it. Right. Well, one can think as an intermediate step, simply the development of the Rolls-Royce engine, yeah. which we sent across them. And the way they yes. suited it and put yes. it out in Korea. Yes. Yes. Mm. yes. yes. Well, so again, um, if we can go on beyond 1945, and before just looking at one or two things that you were doing after that, one question did occur to me. You had not originally intended to join the Royal Air Force as a career. Were you in any doubt in 1945 whether you should stay or go, go out and, and pick up a civilian career? I didn't have any real uh, doubt. And when one was offered a, a permanent commission fairly soon after the war, mm. I had enjoyed my, if you could put it that way, wartime yes, experience, yes, but it was yes, exciting yes, in a young, yes, young yes, man, yes, yeah. yes. and I had managed to stay on a squad nearly all of the war, and I uh, had felt the esprit de corps so, yes. so strongly, and got to love the Royal Air Force, that, that goes without saying, that uh, I had no hesitation in, in, in staying because the, the life was fun and I enjoyed mm -hmm. flying, and I enjoyed it very much. Mm -hmm. After the war, you spent some time in a variety of training appointments. Um, there was the Land Air War College. Orlando War School, rather. Then you came to Staff College in Andover. And I'd like to pick up another theme, if I could, at this point, because obviously your name is well known now, not just as, as a CDS, but also with your constant, constant emphasis on thinking and looking beyond and thinking more broadly. Um, Andover in those days, um, a relatively new post war college with what, the third or fourth group of international students. What do you retain any impressions of, of, of Andover? Did you have opportunity? Was it an influence on you? Did it, did it occur to you then to say, now I've got to start thinking at the age of 20, whatever it was? Yes, I think so. I just first of all remind you that Andover was the, the, the situation of the very first staff college, yes, right. the first staff right. college that the yes, Royal Air Force ever had, and uh, then moved to Bulstrode Park yes, and then right. back to Andover and eventually yep. to, to Bracknell. Yep. Uh, but of course, as you say, it had become the sort of uh, the foreign student uh, college. Um, yes, it had a great impression on me, clearly. Uh, one had come off a squad, one had come off flying, generally speaking. One didn't really know how to write a service letter or service appreciation. One didn't really care about it very much either, to be honest. But slowly but surely, the, uh, the, the staff, uh, the director staff, uh, very skillfully brought through to these rather hairy uh, ex squadron people that there was another aspect to uh, life in the Royal Air Force, but, uh, but flying airplanes in a very important uh, aspect it was. The, the, the feelings of uh, air power began to come through from Andover, so not to the extent that they did eventually when I came back to Bracknell on the directing staff. Now when 50% uh, or 60% of the students at uh, Andover were foreigners, of which 20% uh, of those couldn't speak English. To a certain extent, the Royal Air Force students had a st head start. Uh, but one built up a great many uh, uh, relationships, which I've uh, carried on over this whole period of 40 years at Andover, and we were all very sad that uh, when Andover uh, finished. Yes. However, they have come to Bracknell, generally speaking, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's been good both for Bracknell and, uh, and, and, and the foreigners coming in and mixing with the Royal Air Force. Yes. Before you came back to Bracknell on the directing staff, you had a serious illness and you were laid low for quite some time, weren't you? Just yes. 50, 51 time. 
I, I was in hospital for two years, very nearly, uh, because I had a sort of a disease of the heart valve, which uh, a bug had uh, settled on my heart valve for no, no known reason at the moment, having been playing first-class rugby at the time, but yeah. there was, I was laid low. And uh, penicillin wouldn't touch it, none of, the, none of the antibiotics would touch it, and uh, one was not, uh, one's life expectancy was not, uh, was very, not very great. But uh, uh, eventually, uh, I would call it a miracle, uh, I, uh, it, the bug became, uh, uh, became sensitive to penicillin uh, and uh, was a new drug uh, discovered in the United States which the Air Force flew over to this country and I was treated with this. Uh, it all happened about the same time that I suddenly realized that uh, there was more to life uh, from the point of view of the, the Christian approach to life than you know, just, just carrying on. And it all seemed a very, something of a miracle to me. I was cured. Uh, and the Air Force had been very good to me. They kept me in hospital on full pay for this period of two years. Well, after that time, and so more or less in a period of recuperation, you came here um, subsequently to the, the DS at Bracknell. Um, you then had, a, I think, a completely different experience from here when you went to be um, CO of the University of Air Squadron, University of London Air Squadron. Was that your first firm contact with university air crew? I know, obviously, you met them personally through the war, but had you had any personal contact with any university organization before then? Yes, uh, first I'd say that uh, the period of recuperation at the DS at the I started no, at Bracknell, uh, it wasn't I uh, it was like my that. idea, yeah, but no, I was no, three years after, on the after DS that. and not a moment no, of it was no, recreation. No, uh, it was recreation. hard life. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, University of London yes. Squadron, uh, I had this limited flying category. They were looking for a command flying appointment uh, Having mind you, had two squadrons during the war, but they were still looking for a peacetime uh, training appointment for me, and this seemed to be a suitable one. It uh, opened up the whole of the University of London. I got to know all the colleges and all the principals, and uh, I did get, a, as you say, uh, a, a very interesting uh, impression of the academic world and uh, the great value the academic world would have for certain aspects of the military. They have a place, of course, but uh, I felt that the military could be using the academic world much more than they, uh, than the, they had been up, up to then. I'm still at the wing commander rank, of course, and I had really very little influence to be able to, uh, to, to expand this, but I, I put it away uh, for the future that one could use to mention. Come back. Yep. Come back but, of course, did the broadening, as it were, continue with your next appointment, which I think was PSO to Sir Dermot? And if you'll forgive me one second, just last week I received a note from Sir Dermot which said, I'm delighted to hear that you will shortly have Sir Neil on your programme. He's a good story to tell and has the advantage of being properly trained. He was once my PSO. <laughs> <laughs> um, but more seriously, at that time, of course, 1958, the year of the Sandys impl implementation. Yes. What impression did you form from that? outer office, or from the view from that outer office, of the impact on the service around you? Mm. Um, did you glean any impression which stayed with you to influence your subsequent thing? Oh, yes, several, I think. Uh, the first thing it was, uh, I would like to say, it was a remarkable experience to be PSO to Sir Dammit, uh, for two years. First of all, he was a great chief of the air staff. He had a tremendous ability to communicate. He was a great aviator, of course. He got around the Air Force uh, a great deal, and uh, uh, he did a great tour around all the commands, explaining the whole situation about the Duncan Sands situation to them, and generally raising morale, which he did extremely uh, successfully. And I again put that in my computer for use eventually yeah. when I became CS, yeah. because we yeah. did something rather similar. But uh, it was, of course, a wonderful experience of seeing how power works at the Chiefs of Staff, uh, Prime Ministerial Cabinet. Uh, level. It was the period of the Duncan Sands Acts. Uh, it was the period when uh, Sands wanted to put coastal command into, uh, into under the Navy, which uh, Sir Dammit fought tooth and nail. We all helped in our humble way. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, it was very interesting. Morale was very low, as you remember. Mm -hmm. Sands said uh, the missile will do everything. Yes. There is no yes. hardly any role for, for air crew. Yes. And Sir Dammit approached Harold Macmillan, who was then the Prime Minister, and told him what the situation was as far as the morale of air crew was concerned, which shocked Harold to a certain extent. Uh, and uh, the suggestion was put to him, would he come up to Cranmore and make a major speech at Cranmore at a passing out parade at the lunch afterwards, which we could use throughout the Air Force as a sort of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, facts to yeah. support the fact that there was a future for the air crew in the, in, the, in the days ahead. Well, we all helped to write the speech for the Prime Minister and he added his own particular uh, piece and uh, of course I went and I was at the lunch when he delivered, which he did admirably. It was a marvellous speech in the only way that Harold Macmillan can, can put a, a speech over and uh, we of course had the text. We copied the text widely around the Air Force in using, including using phrases from it to a certain extent in our recruiting uh, uh, pamphlets. And uh, it did the trick, but uh, it was uh, a, great, uh, a great effort on his part to agree to do it and do it so very well. And uh, we took him after the speech around, around certain elements of the Air Force to show him uh, what was going on. But this was a very interesting period, and a, a period I think one comes out with the lesson that uh, air power and all its associations, you can never be certain what is going to happen next what is going to be happening in the next three or four years. Duncan Sands made up his mind that the missile was in, without ever knowing in any depth what the full significance and implications would be of the Soviet Union having all these missiles, etc., and what the Soviet Union capability and intentions might be against us. So uh, uh, it didn't last very long, yes. really, but it was a very hazardous period, yes. not only for the CAS, but for the Chiefs of Staff as a whole. But I think, uh, eventually, uh, we came out uh, with a plus yeah. point. There's another theme, in fact, so if we could come back to it in a different context in a moment. But just to reflect that both Sir Dermot um, and Sir William Dixon both said that that particular paragraph about there being no future for the, the manned aircraft was actually put in by Duncan Sands himself after the Chiefs had completed the drafts. Mm. But that, as I said, I'd like to come back in a different context when we talk about the relationship with the politicians later on. Now, from there, uh, I think in 1961, you went to be station commander at Abingdon because of the, the medical yes. restriction. Uh, there was no, it was a great honour to be station commander at well, Abingdon, I was going never to, mind I, the medical no, restriction. I was going to put this question to you, sir, whether you regarded Abingdon and the transport force and the Cinderella department of the Royal Air Force at that time? Well, I think to be honest, it must have, uh, it, it came very low on the, on the list, uh, list of priorities. Uh, so often that the, the fighting teeth, if you would call it that, rather than the logistic and support teeth, were given the, were given the priorities. Uh, at Abingdon at that time we had two Beverly squadrons, that aircraft designed by committee in the Ministry of Defence, which, uh, though it was much criticised, it had its, it had its, uh, had its virtues from a uh, road carrying and parachute dropping point of view, and a Hastings squadron. And it was a very lively station because we were still in the Far East, we were still in the Middle East and right. Aden, and uh, of course we were extremely busy. And uh, morale was high, the air crew were a very high category indeed, and uh, it was almost like uh, being on a, on, a, on, a, on a fighter station in, in the old days, but they had a, a special qualities, I think, the, the transport people. But generally speaking, and I think uh, this has carried on down the years, that uh, transport has been inclined to who have been at the sort of tail end of... Uh, of, of funds, when yeah. funds are being spent, and that we make do with what we've got. And uh, this may be all be right because of the high technology of some of the, f the forward and frontline aircraft. Do you think that had any additional influence on the subsequent decision? Now, I know when you went back about 12 years later to be AOC of, of, of 46 Group, <clears throat> for obvious, clear political reassessments of strategy and the withdrawal to Europe, um, there was a, at least a plausible, if not a completely credible case for with reducing the transport force. Do you think there was any residual lack of understanding in the Air Force, and particularly at board level, of the importance of that kind of flexibility of air power, that is, the ability to distribute power rather than to apply it itself? Do you think that this was any factor at all in the reduction? I don't think so too much. It's fairly natural. If you were going to come from a sort of worldwide posture back to mm. Europe with the distances that were uh, assumed, the fact that one had a civil airline of some strength and that there were uh, charter possibilities, yes. etc., the distances weren't great, then I think it was almost natural at that time, particularly with some of the decisions on equipment that the Air Force Board were facing, that yeah. the, the mind would be more on this sort of central front in Europe than they would be on Aden and the Middle East and, and Far East and Belize and other places like that. So I think it was reasonable that uh, that's the way it came out. As it developed, of course, things uh, have turned out very differently. And uh, here we find ourselves now increasing the transport force, yes. getting back to an airborne forces capability, a heavy drop capability, station-keeping radar. 
possibly some of the right. uh, some of the great areas issue. which you can put down a, a parachute battalion right. uh, at, uh, at one go. But uh, then we were working, of course, with the parachute brigade at uh, Aldershot, a very close liaison, and uh, highly, highly, highly efficient. But uh, this will come again, as it did for a period during the uh, Jet 4 operation when I was AOC uh, 46 group. Right. And uh, we worked up a very high uh, operational uh, status of pu about putting down a battalion uh, group uh, in one in one drop in, in a fairly short period. Yes. Um, in between those two times, in between the, the period of your station commander at Abingdon and the subsequent assumption of Commander 46 Group, in fact, your career had, had broadened considerably. And it's interesting to see how it's it's gone in been sort of two, two parallel patterns. In the one, perhaps carrying on the Andover idea, you've been broadening your international con uh, contacts as you did at uh, what was then still IDC. Uh, then, and again, if I'm out, I'll come back to this for a second, we go on to the, the um, program evaluation work and ACDS poll. But before you moved into that closest or highest level of policy formulation, you spent again a different kind of, uh, of career uh, posting to Cranwell, didn't you? Assistant Commandant. Yes, that was after uh, uh, IDC and right. going for a year and going to shape. To shape. Yes. yes, I went to Assistant Commandant for a period to, to Cranwell, and it was a very interesting period because uh, 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 the Commandant Ian Lawson and uh, the Director of Studies of, of the day and uh, Dr. Tully today, yes. and uh, John Rowlands, who was yeah. the uh, Commandant of Technical, mm -hmm. and that was the time also when Henlow moved from Henlow to Cranwell, yeah. so one was yeah. responsible for bedding them in at, at, at uh, Cranwell and getting it off the ground. We felt at that time very strongly, all three of us, uh, and I think the bulk of people at the college, that it would be a very good idea if we could uh, get a degree at Cranmore for those who had uh, passed sufficient subjects and yeah. passed through the course yeah. then, then going on to the specialist subject afterwards, because this was a very powerful period when the degree was, was everything, everybody wanted to go to university, and I think uh, at that time, it would have been a very good thing if it, uh, it had just been successful. Well, we, we got the degree accepted by the Council of National Academic, Academic Awards. Uh, they were happy that our syllabus was, uh, syllabi was, uh, was of the standing. But there was a great deal of uh, opposition against it uh, in higher authority, and um, it never really got any further than that. Since, of course, we've uh, gone towards the graduate entry, and this has this developed in, in a slightly different direction, I still believe it was a slight pity that we didn't get things going at the time, because I think that would have made a difference in some of the thinking that went into the graduate entry. I, I happen to be in support of the graduate entry entirely now, so I'm right behind it, and I believe that... Uh, going to university for the sort of cadre of officers, our main cadre of officers, is a very good uh, way of, of, of starting service. Do you think it's necessarily a better thing to go at the start of service than it is later on? Well, I think there's, there, there, uh, there's, there could be support for both ways of going about it, and I think there are certain people who would certainly benefit from going to university after they had been to uh, done squadron service, mm. were a little more mature maybe, a little, and it would certainly have happened in my case, may I say, and uh, a little more uh, ready to accept uh, university training and a great deal better out of it. Others, I think, would have benefited much more going straight from school to university as, as the graduate entry is now. Yes, yes, I suppose the other reflection would be that one thinks now of the scheme which you just introduced, or did introduce before you left MOD, of the MPhil students in October, where you're sending GD wing commanders in their late 30s. It's not just them who are going to benefit, one hopes it's going to be the service as well, but not just from their enrichment, but the contribution they're going to make from the service to the university. Well, I certainly hope so. I think the message is bound to get round in the yeah. service, and this is a very good way of going about it, because I think these people are getting enormous experience, but also uh, the good that uh, they will do in universities. And I remind you, of course, this has been part and parcel of the aim and object of the university air yeah. squadrons right from the very start, and they're very, very successfully they've been. But I think these people have got the MPhil people at Cambridge, and it's only Cambridge. Nowhere else, nowhere else to stomach it at the moment. Mm. And you can go there without a first degree, I remind you, mm. which is a big step forward for Cambridge. Uh, and I'm glad to say a lot of really good material, I'm told, from the Royal Air Force are coming forward to, to go for this. Uh, I think it has a great uh, beneficial effect on the university and we'll have more and more as the days go by. Because if we do, then obviously we're going to be in a position to pick up a sort of secondary theme of your own. And if I could now just move on from Cranwell to the programme evaluation group and then the subsequent appointment was ACDS Paul. 
Um, there are several points I'd like to put to you, sir, about that. Could you just say a very brief word about the evaluation group? Because that won't be familiar, I think, to everybody. You were working for Dennis Healy, weren't you? Yes, one was plucked out of uh, college at Cranwell, uh, slightly against one's better judgment, in, uh, over a period of 24 hours, to go to this sort of cabinet, which uh, uh, Secretary of State for Defence, then Dennis Healy, uh, who in the middle of his seven-year period was setting up along the lines of the uh, Robert McNamara mm. analysts of the of the United States. This was all the rage at the time. Uh, and uh, it consisted of uh, Air Force, Army, Navy uh, officers of one-star status and a scientist of one-star status and a civil servant. Uh, and the, the chairman and boss was a, a scientist of two-star. Uh, and Healy would uh, throw a work at us uh, every now and again to examine remits which had been sent forward to him by the service departments to examine and give an independent uh, evaluation of these uh, particular remits. And uh, uh, we worked very closely with him. Uh, we saw a lot of him. He consulted us uh, a great deal. But of course, uh, it doesn't take long to recognize that the service departments are not entirely entranced by the fact that um, they have these, uh, these officers and this group a uh, rather mixed group, advising the Secretary of State round the Chiefs of Staff uh, uh, back. Now, it never happened to me, but uh, it happened to my colleagues that the, their service departments turned off the flow of information very quickly, and uh, uh, they were, uh, they were uh, in great difficulties because they really weren't getting the right sort of information to feed in. But what really turned out was a sort of uh, a mirror image of the Chiefs of Staff organization coming down to the Army, Navy, and Air yes. Force group under this evaluation group, which yes. was advising yes. Healy. In the end, he, uh, after a year of activity, uh, some successful, some unsuccessful, he decided that it, it was time it was wrapped up, but he, he got the Chiefs of Staff to agree that the sort of cadre of us became part and parcel of what he was going to set up as the new policy staff uh, in the Ministry of Defence. And it was a bit of give and take on both sides. The Chiefs were pleased to see the back of the programme evaluation group <laughs> Healy got his way to a certain extent, and some of us uh, moved into the into the policy staff, and I was uh, promoted and uh, was the first uh, ACDS Paul and formed the policy staff uh, at, at that time right. with the various uh, departments in the staff, mm -hmm. and uh, it got off, I think, uh, to, to a goodish start. Very distinguished period. Yes. Did you? Nobody well, loved us, mind you. No, even then. Well, <laughs> did, did you feel the division of loyalties as ADC, ACDS Paul? Uh, loyalty to the Royal Air Force. Yes. Well, yes, but I mean, inevitably, one had to, uh, as one has to when one's moving into a, a central staff appointment. One really has to put those, uh, without putting them totally away, yes, one has yes. to would put them, generally speaking, away that you've hand taken yes. into service for you, and otherwise the job would have been completely untenable yes. as far as the, uh, the other two chiefs of staff uh, were concerned if uh, one had not been purple. I really did bend over backwards to be purple, I think, uh, which uh, the Air Force mm -hmm. weren't at times uh, entirely uh, in transfer. Right. You could look at the most phases of British defence policy since, 90, since 1945, and with the possible exception of the expansion of 1951, or soon after, you could say that it was one difficult period after the other. But that period, 68 plus, must have been among the most difficult. Well, it was, I think. Uh, there was a constant. Uh, constant running down, changing of equipment. There was the devalu devaluation crisis, yes. you remember, yeah. happened over a weekend yes. when uh, the Air Force lost uh, two, if not three, major types. The TSR-2 yes. disappeared out of the window. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a distinctly difficult period. Uh, of course, uh, one has to uh, linger for a moment on the personality of the Secretary of State for Defence, Dennis Healy, and his interface uh, with, with the Chiefs of Staff. He had uh, been in the defence field and was a shadow minister of defence for years. He was an international figure already in the defence yep. field before he became uh, Secretary of State. Uh, he was a founder member of the Institute of yep. Strategic Studies. He was known globally in the defence yep. field. Also going into the House of Commons every second Tuesday to answer questions on defence, he became over this period very expert in Army and Navy uh, Air Force trivia or detail, if you would call it that, uh, sometimes uh, uh, aspects which the Chiefs of Staff, because of the fact that they were having to take a broader issue of their own service, didn't have at their fingertips. So everything, in a way, was going for uh, Dennis Healy at that time, and uh, his, his interface with the Chiefs of Staff was not uh, of the happiest, uh, I didn't think. I think uh, when he was convinced of a case and uh, 
he had to go and put the case to cabinet. He, no one did it better. I feel in all my period of, uh, of, uh, mm. of knowledge of the fight or machine, mm. no one did it better once he was convinced and once he was prepared to fight for it. He was of such high intellectual quality yes. and a degree about most of his yes. colleagues yes. that he usually came, uh, he came out uh, with a winner. But of course, things were running down. We were coming back yes. from the fight. It was a difficult period altogether. I think uh, in many ways he did uh, a fair job in, in help breaking the the impact of a return from, 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 from the Far East and other overseas theatres. But I recognise the, uh, the other aspects yes. of it, that he was uh, one of the, he was happened to be in charge when this, yes. uh, this big yes. cutback was taking quite. place. I, one of the, the reasons which prompted the question, quite apart from professional interpretation, coincidentally he's an old boy of my own school, and um, there's a certain amount of folklore mm. uh, back at school, and one of his old masters said that if Dennis Healy had not been a politician he would have been a Jesuit because of his ability to carry an idea mm. to the exclusion sometimes of alternatives. Did you find that quality in him? Did you find that once he'd made his mind up it was difficult to shift, or did you find him amenable to, to rational argument? Because he did set it? high store, didn't he, by academic influence right. and, and, and by a breadth of, breadth of input. It depends who was putting it to him. He had a... Uh, he had a good opinion of some and a poor opinion of others. If someone he had a good opinion of was putting an argument to him, he was prepared to listen. But uh, often he got some pretty poor arguments put to him, I must say, from various uh, uh, areas. And uh, he then just tore us to ribbons because he was of the intellectual status, which, uh, which he could just do that. About being a Jesuit, I'm not so sure. Uh, I saw him the other day and was talking about him and uh, what his religious beliefs were now. I'm not sure he had any. Uh, but uh, he's still very interested in defence, and there'll be books by Healy uh, eventually on defence in a very interesting period, and it'll be very interesting. I've read the first draft of uh, one of them, and it's, uh, it's going to be good, uh, an interesting start. And then, just again, then go back to I have another theme. Um, I think he also did institute a regular meeting with academics, didn't he? Academics working in the defence field. Yes. But didn't I hear that he was considering seconding Laurie Martin to a specific consultancy post, Professor Laurie Martin of London? Yes, that was true. Uh, it was, didn't quite work out. I think no. the civil service rallied to be able to block it all right. Yes. But uh, uh, that is true. Uh, but. Uh, I think uh, one thing he did was he put Alistair Buchan into the right. IDC right. and then changed its name to the Royal College of yes. Defence Studies. Yes. And uh, well, we all played a part in, in reorganising the the, uh, the syllabus at, uh, at Belgrave Square. And uh, though there was a great deal of criticism at the time that we had put a civilian into, even a mm. civilian of, of Alistair's calibre, yeah. into Belgrave Square, I think nearly everybody now uh, agrees that it was a great success and his pattern now the seminar work and the way business is done at Belgrave Square is still the pattern of uh, individual theses by uh, students etc getting them to use their brains and mm -hmm. read a lot more than they did when I was there in 1963 and it, it's still the pattern now that was one of his things but uh, generally he visited the universities a great deal Dennis here he did and uh, got a lot of the uh, people there, the defence lecturers, into the various universities, mm. and it was that time they began yes. to be, began to blossom. But one other thing I'd like to mention, and, and, and particularly strongly, he was always very happy to come to a staff college and speak at a staff college and answer questions. Mm. I know of a predecessor of his, Duncan Sands, who, uh, uh, when invited to the IDC, asked that the questions should be sent to him first before he, uh, before he, mm. he stood on the platform. Mm. Now, never so with Healy. He was full of the hurly-burly. RCDS, he was always there, staff colleges, NDC, he was a great supporter of, which uh, I am too, mm -hmm. as you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was always willing to go there and discuss and talk. And he is one of the few uh, honorary members of the uh, National Defence College, uh, Dennis Healy, the three of us. I'm, I'm one of them. He's, he's not. Yes, yes. So, again, looking at that period and looking forward now, just jumping ahead um, again. Obviously, you were impressed by the evaluation group of which you formed part, because I think you were going to emulate it to a certain extent. Later yes, on. I wouldn't say impressed by the evaluation group. I was impressed and serious about the question of defence analysis and examining defence from all sorts yes. of uh, yeah. reasons, just rather than the feeling in the water sometimes, which yeah. wasn't the way some cases were put forward uh, for defence expenditure from some services who I shan't mention. <laughs> uh, and I really felt that uh, the whole thing 
needed to be analysed more carefully. Uh, there was a great deal of work going on in the United States in this field, and I felt this is something which could be well uh, brought into the uh, defence policy staff when, uh, when, when I started that. I thought it worked. Yes. Some, yeah. uh, some would disagree with yes. you. Yes. Most yes. strongly. Yes. yes. Well, <laughs> excuse me. After the, the responsibilities as um, ACDS poll, you went, I think, as deputy commander to Germany, came back, as we already said, uh, as uh, AOC 46 group at Upaven. And then in 1974, you were promoted and sent to the Air Force Board as AMP. Um, I, I would imagine that uh, somewhere in the back of many officers' mind, there's the thought that one day they may make, if not just the next rank, perhaps one above, and perhaps the Air Force Board. Um, had that been your ambition, or were you surprised in 1974 when you were plucked out of 46 Group and sent to the AMP? I, first of all, I had never seriously felt or have looked forward to thinking I was going to be another promoted to another rank or ever be on the Air Force Board. I, that, I say that absolutely honestly. Uh, the question of being a AMP never occurred to me for one second. I mean, I can think of other things I, I thought I might have done reasonably well, but being AMP, no. Uh, but uh, Sir Andrew Humphrey, when he became CAS, uh, called me over from Germany one day and said, uh, I would like you to be, after a period as AOC 46 group, to be a, a member for personnel. So uh, knowing what a, a great job it is, and uh, some of the uh, distinguished predecessors, I, uh, I shuddered a bit and said, uh, of course, I'm very happy and willing, willing to do it. A new departure for me. As such it was, so I had a little more time in Germany, came back as AOC 46 group for a year, and then went in to be the AMP slot at a, at a particularly difficult time, may I say. I, I, I found myself using the word difficult frequently when I was looking through the notes and thinking about the questions to put to you, sir, but that really was the time of the contraction. Yes. Um, some of the decisions which were made um, were perhaps controversial, and some of them were provoked comment and still do provoke comment. Um, if I could ask you a specific comment first on the redundancy programme, I and mean, you know my hobby horse on this, um, the feeling that perhaps, although we had to balance, we had to trim manpower costs, the, the, the balance wasn't right, a feeling that perhaps the decision that was taken was taken quickly, perhaps it was implemented hastily, and although compared to the Army and the Navy we did achieve our objective, and surgery was essential, that perhaps the scar which was carried could have been rather serious. Would you, would you care to comment on that? Well, I think, I, yes, I would. First thing is I would like to just uh, disabuse you of the idea that the decision was taken quickly. You almost suggested irresponsibly. Well, far from it. Uh, we had thought about it for a long time. We knew the problem. We knew we were going to have to close cross stations. We knew we had a lot of uh, people that uh, were going to were going to be being redundant. I will also remind you that the Air Force had gone in for a cutting policy of its own right. initiative yeah, and cut, in my view, perhaps yeah. too far back, where the other two services hadn't done that. So where we had on top of already the the, the, the considerable cutting we we'd made these cuts which came along because of the closure of the trial station. But the decision was taken very slowly and carefully by the Air Force Board. I put it to them, but uh, the Under Secretary of State and all the members of the Air Force Board, of course, had the say, and they all agreed that we should go ahead as we, as we did. Now, the arguments go something like this. For instance, the Navy had no problem, really, a very limited redundancy program. They were heavily undermanned at the time, so they really, and the natural outflow of people from the Navy, uh, were going to see them clear in the next two or three years. So they had they had no real problem. The Army's case was, and uh, the Adjutant General, who uh, uh, was my opposite number, of course, in the Army, uh, said to me quite freely, well, this will go away. We're going to leave this for four or five years and sort it out as, as, as time goes by. And uh, the government will change, there will be a new policy, something will happen, we won't have to do it. It's been, if I may say so, of that great service, uh, <laughs> their policy for a good number of years on many, on many, many things. My view and the Air Force Board view was that we had to do this, it would be better for the service to do it fairly quickly and get over the scar scars which were bound to to be there yeah. as quickly as we possibly yeah. could, rather than the Army technique, which the scars are still 
are carrying uh, five years yes. afterwards. The operations were still carrying five years afterwards. And uh, the scars just taking longer and longer to heal. Now, this yes. is a, a decision one has to make yes. when one is in, a, in an appointment yes. like that. And uh, the Air Force Board has to make uh, in certain circumstances. I stand by it. I happen to believe it's the right one. I recognize it's still a controversial decision in, in the service and that scars are still left. But I feel that it was the right way to go about it do it fairly quickly and uh, after due consideration. Thank you very much. You know, I'd obviously no wish to impute, even suggest any irresponsibility. It's the old American thing of 2020 hindsight or Monday morning quarterbacking. And in fact, there's a point emerges from it, which I know you do feel strongly about. And if I could lead from that, and regrettably now time is beginning to press upon us, if I could lead from that to your appointment as CAS, when I believe you had a pretty clear idea of your priorities, CS, didn't you? Yes, I had. I, uh, of course, had moved from AMP to be CS direct without right. without going out again. Right. And with the redundancy program and uh, the problems and the scars, as you say, weighing heavily on my heart, I was determined that communications were going to get yes. through, yes. right through to the yes. service. Now, we are not a good service in communicating and never have been. We're better now. But it's, I think it's the station organization that makes it difficult. It gets down quite often to group commanders and chiefs, to group commanders, to station commanders. And then the station commander, maybe working a shift system, has difficulty in getting hold of his, his troops to be able to tell them what the message is. And sometimes the message gets weaker as it comes down, and he is not perhaps able to answer the questions. Easy in the Army and the Navy, a good deal. But uh, that was one of the main things, was to get communications going. And I asked the Air Force Board to get out and talk to stations. We divided the Air Force up amongst us. Mm -hmm. And we went and spoke to all the airmen and officers on every station in the Royal Air Force. And I think this, uh, this helped get communi yes. communications yes. going, yes. which were much better. Uh, the other thing was, of course, to get forward thinking going and get air power thinking going again, because uh, it had with cuts, 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 and one or two other reasons, which I won't go into, uh, fallen into a certain amount of decline. The staff colleges were being reduced in time. They were just supermarkets mm -hmm. to be able to yeah. people to write letters, etc. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's maybe as important. But it's, it's, yeah. Trench Hard had something yeah. much yeah. more in yeah. mind than yeah. able to write letters. Right. He wanted people to think about air power and, and, and develop their ideas about air power. And that was uh, my second aspect. The third was then to see what new technology was going to do as far as the Air Force was concerned in the next two decades so that we could get some good idea uh, where our equipment was going to take us and also getting a big dialogue going amongst air crew on their own equipment, being the people who should know about what their future equipment would be. And uh, one likes to think one had some success in that. Yes. yes. Then, after a regrettably short time, as far as the Royal Air Force was concerned, um, because of the tragic loss of Sir, Sir Andrew, you became Chief of the Defence Staff. And so after some 12 years, 10 years, barely, you're wearing purple again. But you must have been very conscious of changed times. Even though we, when we were nothing like out of the wood, there appears to be, from my level at least, a very different political attitude, um, even though the same party is in power, without moving into party politics at all, a different political attitude, perhaps a changed attitude in the country, mm. a greater awareness of defence, there's the Russian move and so on. Is this how it seemed to you, sir, when you... When you yes, I think, I think so. There was just a slight amount of money more. The, uh, uh, the cutback, a severe cutback had stopped and people were moving ahead. But most important, I think, uh, there was a, a greater realisation in the country that uh, the nation was in danger again, that there was a Soviet threat developing. And I think this has is, is grown and grown and grown and has continued to grow, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to say. This made a big difference. And this communicated to uh, politicians, they saw that the, the nation was worried and that defence for them, again, became uh, became of some import. Certainly, uh, in my days as CDS compared with the ACDS Paul days, there was an entirely different feeling, and I think this feeling was getting out through the services yep. as well. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, we, we may talk about the pay situation, but of course this was the one of the uh, main uh, issues of my whole period as CDS, uh, and, and going back to my AMP days, it's not a bad idea for a CDS to have been AMP or Agent General, but I was determined that the pay issue was going to come to the Chiefs of Staff. It had become such a morale issue, it yep. was natural and right that the Chiefs of Staff should deal with it personally. Now normally the PPOs, right principal personnel officers yep. do it. Yep. But uh, I, I felt that we had to take it out of their hands largely and for, make it a Chiefs of Staff issue, which we did. 
and we fought the pay campaign very bitterly, may I say, as chiefs of staff. And uh, I like to think, in the end, some of the means may be uh, debatable. Yes. In the end, uh, sure. it was successful. Not yes. so successful in conditions of service, but these are beginning no, to come to a certain extent, and there's still, still problems still there. But I think the pay, pay what? Yeah. Uh, the other thing at the time, of course, was that uh, the Labour government was still very anxious to change certain aspects of. Uh, of defence, for instance, to withdraw, withdraw divisions from Germany to yes. go for a, a maritime and air strategy or a land strategy. Yes. And uh, one was fighting a rearguard action to a certain extent against another defence review. And uh, we had what uh, we, I called the Way Ahead Committee during my period, and uh, this went into the, into the situation in great deal of, of care. I think so. Um, you are very modest in missing out one very important point. You mentioned the communication gap, which I, I think certainly has been there. But we associate the name of Sir Andrew Humphrey and now yourself with a much greater public exposure. We not only know the name of our leader, we've seen him, we've heard him, we know that he's standing up for what, he's, what we're doing. There was one incident, of course, which is internationally known, which I would like to ask you about. That's the Chinese incident, uh, which provoked a fair amount of comment. What, what exactly happened under those circumstances? What exactly did you say? about the, the Russian position to your Chinese hosts. How did it come about? It? Well, we had spent the morning out on the tank uh, uh, demonstration, not demonstration area, operational area, uh, not far from the Great Wall as it happened. And uh, the uh, very elderly Chinese tanks are being through, going through the places very, very well. Uh, and then at, uh, I suppose it'd be quarter to 12, lunch was called and we all went into this uh, mess hall with all the tank commanders and everybody else who helped mend tanks, this is the way it happens in China. Very good democratic stuff. And uh, we sat down to lunch and the, the, uh, the base commander or the regimental commander uh, proposed my, my toast, of my, of my health, and uh, made a short speech. And uh, I, I replied to him and said exactly what it was reported. I've said that uh, we had a common enemy uh, and uh, this is, uh, this is exactly what, what I did say, and uh, which, was, which was reported. I think events have uh, borne me out to a certain extent, wouldn't you agree? Yes, I would indeed. So time is now almost upon us, and I wonder if I could just put one very quick final question to you. If you had a word to leave with the staff officers graduating from Bracknell in 1980, what would it be? Well, if I could have two or three words, if we have time. One, the great, and first of all, operational flying, and all that goes with operations is primary importance, let's never forget that. But second, when one comes into the staff field, uh, it really is very important to see the wider issues of everything that's associated with the Air Force and air power, but particularly thinking about air power, the new technology, etc. And this means reading, deep reading, keeping it up, not just during the period of the staff college, but by really working at it, once one leaves the staff college and the future appointments one takes, I think that's extremely important. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Finally, may I thank you very much indeed for being with us this afternoon and wish you absolute success in your new career as Principal of King's College London. Thank you very much indeed, Thank you. Sir. Thank you.